you're fired. Nothing personal. Word of the day. Good morning. It is Tuesday, January 19th, 2021, and the New York Mets have stepped in it again. It was breaking news last night. A story came out that new Mets GM hired on December 13th, 2020. His name is Jared Porter. Had engaged in unwanted advances via text and had sent a picture of his penis to a reporter who worked for MLB or was an MLB reporter internationally. 62 unanswered texts and she kept them all. She had told the Chicago Cubs, because this is back in 2016, maybe when he worked for the Cubs, she had told someone with the Cubs it had never gone anywhere. He then moved to the Arizona Diamondbacks. Never came up, never went anywhere. Jared Porter was rising through the ranks of baseball, very sought after in the Theo tree. The Mets could not make a hire of a president of baseball operations. They passed on Michael Hill for reasons that escaped me and many people within the game. They decided to go with Jared Porter from the Diamondbacks, lauded as a great hire, a man of great integrity, a great baseball mind, detailed, smart, and will help lead the Mets under new owner, new owner Steve Cohn. Background of Steve Cohn we've discussed is very simple. He was not unanimously approved to become owner, which is something that most owners are when the vote comes. The vote is generally 30 to zero. There was a faction of owners who did not want him to buy the Mets even at that great price because Steve Cohn in his business on Wall Street, his hedge fund, has been littered with complaints violations, sanctions, censures, fines, sexual harassment, sexual discrimination. Too many to mention. Steve Cohn buys the Mets. He's the savior as compared to the Wilpon family. Every new owner comes in as a savior, assuming they're taking over for a group that's not liked and every group at the end of the day is not liked. Steve Cohn goes to Twitter, builds a following, is jocular on Twitter, asking for suggestions, talking about on Christmas Day, calling Jared Porter to find out when signings are going to happen or trades are going to be made. Mets have been active trading for Lindor, including a trade yesterday where they picked up some rotation depth. Everything's going well. Phone call comes last night to Sandy Alderson. And it goes something like this. Hey, Sandy, it's Jared. We got a situation. ESPN is running a story. They called for a comment. I didn't give one. The story is that I sent 62 unanswered text messages to a woman. I was trying to meet up with her, trying to have her meet with me when I was with the Cubs. I didn't take the hint. I sent a picture of a penis. She didn't respond. And that was the end of it. Somehow she's talking now to ESPN. Can we call ESPN and get them not to run this story? Maybe he said that. Maybe he just said, get back to me, Sandy. But I just wanted to give you fair warning. Sandy Alderson, the Harvard educated, he, uh, member of the armed forces, upstanding man of great integrity, meant to help Steve Cohn get a new reputation, start fresh. Either can reach Steve or cannot, unclear at this point. At this point, we don't know. What we do know is Sandy Alderson released a statement last night. And I want to tell you what it said and how that works. I've spoken directly with Jared Porter regarding events that took place in 2016, of which we were made aware tonight for the first time. Jared has acknowledged to me his serious error in judgment, has taken responsibility for his conduct, has expressed remorse, and has previously apologized for his actions. He's referring to the fact that in text of the 62 texts, he had apologized to this woman saying, hey, 
I hope you weren't offended by the penis picture. I won't contact you again. Sandy Alderson continued, the Mets take these matters seriously, expect professional and ethical behavior from all of our employees, and certainly do not condone the conduct described, wait for it, in your story. We will follow up as we review the facts regarding this serious issue. That statement is wrong. It's a CYA statement made by an organization that doesn't have a clue how to operate. And why do I say it? And why am I coming down so hard on the Mets right now? Because I'm furious. You have a chance to start fresh if you're Steve Cohn. We're giving you a chance to forget the type of operation you've run in the past, to forget the way you've always been. You can start now. Sandy Alderson released a statement that obviously was a statement given to ESPN because it says, certainly do not condone the conduct described in your story. I didn't do a story. CBS didn't do a story. It's an ESPN story. So this isn't a statement to the world. This is a statement to maybe be included in an ESPN article that's going to come out. And it is about damage control. It wasn't the first thought of Sandy. Uh Uh-oh, we may have to fire this guy. Was Steve Cohn sleeping? Was Steve Cohn called? When I'm running the Marlins and I have a situation like this come up, I wake up the owner if he's sleeping. I call the doorman. If I can't reach him, I try anyone who could be in the house and then I get people to go to the house if he's located in a place that I'm not or I go there myself. Because this is baseball, this is New York, even if it's Miami, this is front page news and we have to act smartly, swiftly, and without question, this ends in a termination. I go to the owner and say, here's what happened, here's what we need to do, and here's the statement ready to go now. Instead, Sandy releases that statement. Somehow the PR people and Steve Cohn agreed to it if they knew. Then we wake up this morning and Steve Cohn and Sandy Alderson realized they had no other choice. Were they floating a trial balloon to see if they could just let this pass? And that's why they did the statement last night. Hey, he apologized. If it's like steroids, you can just apologize and move on. This is 2021. This is the final day of a presidency where maybe the social moral compass has been eroded over years, but is being built up again now. Maybe there was a feeling, we're good. You apologize, Jared. We're going to stand behind you, but we have to say we don't condone it. Meanwhile, in the commissioner's office, here's what's happening. Rod Manford is not sleeping. He gets the call from Dan Hallam. Dan Hallam finds out exactly what's happening, calls Rob and says, here's what's going on with the Mets and with Jared Porter. We understand this could be a long-term play with Theo and Jared. We just hired Theo. Jared is Theo's guy. Rob, we got to make sure that Jared gets terminated if he hasn't been already. Rob, we can't have people thinking that Steve Cohn is doing business as usual the way he runs his Wall Street firm. This is exactly what we were trying to avoid. Okay, the commissioner says, let's give him 20 minutes. We wake up this morning to a tweet from Steve Cohn. Maybe he's an early riser because of Wall Street. Early to bed, early to rise. I don't care, you wake them. This is not some bird dog scout located in North Dakota, along with all of our listeners. This is the New York Mets. Steve Cohn said, we have terminated Jared Porter this morning. 
in my initial press conference, I spoke about the importance of integrity and I meant it. There should be zero tolerance for this type of behavior. Too far, Steve. You can't say there's zero tolerance for this type of behavior because you've tolerated it in the past and you know it. Differentiate the Mets from Wall Street. Acknowledge where we are in the world today. Acknowledge how you have changed and that now there was no question the minute I heard Now we have terminated Jared Porter this morning. The minute I found out from Sandy Alderson or from Jared Porter or from ESPN, and the minute Jared Porter confirmed that this happened, he was terminated. I didn't need a call from the commissioner. I didn't need any media to push me in any direction. I was swift. I was immediate. And it was me who decided no matter how valuable he was as a baseball hire only one month ago, he was terminated immediately for cause. But the Mets were not done with statements. Staggering to me. Sandy Alderson released another statement this morning. The New York Mets have terminated general manager Jared Porter effective immediately. Jared's actions, as reflected by events disclosed last night, failed to meet the Met standards for professionalism and personal conduct. Keep in mind that 12 hours ago, the Mets don't condone it. We take it seriously. He's acknowledged to me his error in judgment. We will follow up as we review the facts. They must have stayed up all night reviewing the facts. Because this morning, his Jared's actions failed to meet the Mets standards. How do you screw this up if you're New York? I don't care if you're a new owner. You are in New York City. You are one of 30 Major League Baseball teams. The reason for my frustration is that as long as people in charge do not know what line can't be crossed and wait for us in the media or fans to tell them where the line is, there can't be progress made. People of power need to know where the line is, not be told. People in power need to be the leaders, not the followers. Jared Porter is finished. Did Jared Porter have a duty to disclose is part two of this. When you are in an interview and someone says to you, is there anything else you want to say? Any questions you may have? Is there anything in your past that may come up? This is when part two of the story takes place. And this is where I have some issues. Back in 2016, when Jared Porter engaged in this behavior, by the way, I'm going to take a a, a little tangent right now. If a woman or a man, I don't care what your sexual orientation is or both, it doesn't matter. If you're not asked directly to send a suggestive picture, just assume that the person you're sending it to doesn't want it and that you shouldn't do it. If it is in response, hey, send me a picture of your penis. First, pick up the phone, even though kids these days do not speak on the phone, they text. You get verbal confirmation, wait a minute, Are you saying that you want me to send you a picture of my penis? I don't mean to ruin the moment, but I just want to make sure you are saying that. Secondly, don't send a picture of your penis, even if asked. Thirdly, 62 unanswered texts. I learned at my tender age of two score and 12. When you are ghosted, Ghosting doesn't happen at 62. Ghosting happens at three, 
four, five. You want to follow up after a year with a quick checking in? Am I still ghosted? That's one. There are unwritten rules that everyone should know, even if you are a man who's desperate for love and attention and emotional connection, and you think you had it by meeting some woman on the baseball field or in a bar. This woman who received the 62 texts alerted the Chicago Cubs employee, an employee with the Cubs. That employee did nothing with the information. The Arizona Diamondbacks hired him from the Cubs after the Cubs won the World Series in 16, never came up. And the New York Mets hired Jared again with it never having come up. So I ask you, when you are asked in an interview, is there anything we should know? Was it up to Jared to disclose the fact that he had a failed attempt at having sex? Is it up to an employee, prospective employee to say, I got pulled over by a cop for speeding. I got pulled over for potential drunk driving, but I wasn't drunk, didn't have a drink and was not even charged. I had a public intoxication moment in college, but nothing ever came of it. I had a girlfriend and she had a girlfriend and together we were a throuple. What is your responsibility to tell a prospective employer? There's going to be a lot of talk about that today. I do not think that Jared Porter is responsible to tell the Mets when interviewed that four years ago, he texted a woman 62 times. One of them included a picture of a penis. Whether it was his or not, I don't know. But Jared, when asked, by the way, said, by the way, it wasn't mine. It was a stock photo of a erect penis. It may have been under a pair of shorts or not. I'm not sure. Jared Porter was dismissive of this, trying to make sure he kept his job and that this would blow over. The employee for the Cubs has a duty to report what he heard to the GM and the president and then the owner if nothing happens. The Diamondbacks have no duty of all to call the Cubs and say, hey, we're hiring Jared Porter. Is there anything we need to know? The Mets have no duty to speak to the Diamondbacks or the Cubs. So I'm not blaming Porter for not saying anything in an interview. I'm not blaming Alderson for asking it in the interview or the Diamondbacks or Steve Cohn. The lack of judgment by Jared Porter is staggering. What's worse is that in the society we have today and in the industry of baseball, this is a Tuesday. The sports world is littered with women who have been treated this way, all in the name of clubhouse banter and the feeling of power that people in the baseball world feel when they work in baseball. What we're discussing is what you do when confronted with new information. You have a chance when you're the Mets to get it right and say, we didn't know. And by the way, Sandy touched on it last night, saying we were made aware for the first time. Step one, good job, Sandy. Step two, the second we were made aware, that was it. Where does baseball go from here? The Mets now two years in a row, they fired their manager, Carlos Beltran, without managing a game for his involvement in the sign-stealing scandal and being named in the report generated by baseball. This year, their GM gets fired one month into his tenure without having been the GM of a regular season game. Baseball as an industry needs to get smart. We spent, we, there's a fine coca. They spend time trying to make sure that they are 
an industry and a sports that appeals to women. Their view is, and the reason, and this has come up at meetings, why do you want women to engage with baseball and like baseball and come to games? Because women are the decision makers in the household. It is easier for men and families to go to games when the mom or the woman wants to, or for couples to go to games when the girl or woman, girl who's under 18 or the woman wants to. But it's more than that, Major League Baseball. It's more than that for every company, but especially in sports where there has been an environment of harassment, an environment of bad behavior. You have to counsel your teams. You have to train your employees. You have to train your owners, your GMs, and your presidents what is expected and how to act when situations like this come up. Jared Porter's not the first guy. And unfortunately, he won't be the last. The difference is Jared Porter is no longer with the New York Mets, and I do not believe he will get another chance to ever be a general manager again. People are being fired for many reasons today. I think we got to talk about Tennessee, Coca. I want to go into it. There's a, uh, one of my favorite Shakespearean lines is from uh, Henry VI, part two, Shakespeare. You should read him. He's got some good quotes. The quote is, the first thing we do Let's kill all the lawyers. That's something that uh, my first day of law school at Cardozo, affiliated with Yeshiva University, Benjamin N. Cardozo School of Law. First day, it was a class called Elements with Eva Hanks. God, she was scary. I was so scared my first day of law school, by the way. There was a book back in the day called 1L, O-N-E-L, 1L. 1L was a book that all incoming law students were reading back in the uh, in 90 when I started in law school. It was probably started in the late 80s. And it basically was the hell that is first year of law school. And people read it when you're going to law school and people read it and say, I'm not going to go to law school. I read it and said, I'm in. I'm going to law school. I'm going to be fine. Go to my first class. And it was, an, I was not prepared I didn't understand the case that we were supposed to have read. I didn't even know what a holding of a case was. And it's the Socratic method. She's calling on people. To this day, I think about Eva Hanks and the impact she had on me. It's something to be scared straight in a class. And one of the first quotes that you talk about is the Shakespearean quote. Why is that in my head today? It's because there's a coach at Tennessee. His name is Jeremy Pruitt. Tennessee is the college. They're the Tennessee Vols. I think I'm saying that wrong. Vols, V-O-L-S. And is that short for something, Coca? Volunteers, yes. The Tennessee Volunteers. Jeremy Pruitt, head coach, big time program signed to a five-year extension or an extension that would keep him as coach through 2025. He just signed an extension, by the way, September of 2020. Well, yesterday, it came out that Jeremy Pruitt is finished at Tennessee. Fired! Here's why we shouldn't kill all the lawyers, because they save clients money. Jeremy Pruitt had a contract clause in his contract. And you know, I've spoken about this. So I want to do it one more time in very clear words. When you are terminated without cause, you get paid whatever money is owed to you in your contract. Terminated without cause is because the owner wakes up and says, you know what? I want to go a different direction. The athletic director says, you know what? Our biggest booster doesn't like the way you dress. We're going to go a different direction, but you're going to get paid your money. Everybody who signs a contract can be terminated without cause. No matter what, all you have to do is pay the man his money. That's a John Malkovich reference, Coca. But then there's a provision in a contract 
which says termination with cause. Termination with cause is when you fire the employees under contract and you say, bye bye, and we're not paying you another penny. See you later. So Tennessee put together a contract and in the contract, they had a very clear provision of what is termination with cause versus termination without cause. The clause in Pruitt's contract that says what termination for cause is relates to any conduct by the coach that constitutes a level one or level two violation of one or more governing athletic rules or this is big or not and or it can be A or B, not A and B. Conjunction, junction, what's your function? Your function, Schoolhouse Rock taught me, was to teach you whether or not only one side of the equation had to matter or both. Or conduct or emissions by coach that is likely to lead to an NCA finding of a level one or level two violation. Or failure to report a violation of rules to the athletic director or compliance staff or failure to promote and maintain an atmosphere of compliance. And failure to monitor all employees who report directly and indirectly to the coach. Hell yeah. That's one of the great cause paragraphs of all time. Good luck, Jeremy. You are not going to get paid your money. What Jeremy did is that he was supposed to know about the violations that were going on in recruiting, and there were myriad violations. The NCAA is currently investigating. Tennessee is going to do what all these other clubs do, try to do preemptive discipline internally to show the NCAA, hey, look, we get that what we did was wrong. We get we should have known, but we didn't. We are going to preemptively punish ourselves, take away scholarships, make ourselves bowl ineligible. So then all you have to do is say, hey, they took care of it. They're good. As I think about Jeremy Pruitt, I couldn't help but think about the environment of college football and why he did what he did. Jeremy Pruitt works in an industry where his job is to recruit employees without paying them to recruit the best of the best from the home state of Tennessee and places beyond the pines with the promise of a first rate education, a beautiful dorm setup, great workout facilities, great coaching, great ability to put yourself in position to be an NFL player, but no money. the very discussion that is being had around the country of whether or not college players should get paid, the biggest concomitant result of college players not being paid is that there are recruiting violations at every single school. It's not a matter of if you will get caught. It is a matter of when. And it's not a matter of not being able to do it or not wanting to do it or taking the moral high ground because everyone is doing it. That doesn't mean the athletic director, who, by the way, the athletic director of Tennessee is the former coach of Tennessee. The athletic director is also stepping down, though apparently unrelated. His name is Philip Fulmer, Coca is telling me. So Tennessee is now looking for a new AD and a new coach, by the way. The environment that is created ensures that the violations will happen, but the president of these universities gets plausible deniability by putting these terms in a contract. 
by saying, don't you ever, don't you ever. Do you think that any president of any university, and we've spoken to them on this show, do you think that they have any other choice but to publicly say that they had no idea and to privately put in a contract that they can't happen? But do you think they're so misinformed as to believe that everyone at every school is on the up and up? You want to be on the up and up? You're going to be ranked 50th or 75th college football playoff? Forget it. Money brought into your system so you can support other sports like fencing or baseball? Forget about it. The only way this is going to stop is if you start paying college athletes a set slotted scale so there is no difference between what Tennessee can offer and what Alabama can offer or what the University of Miami Hurricanes can offer. Because by definition, when a high school kid who comes looking for a place to play, have grown up without any money. The parents have been counting on them to make it big. These are the single most susceptible group of people to these recruiting violations. In the competitive world of attracting talent, the differentiating factors when they can't be money are the things that can be translated into money. I can't give you cash, but guess what? Your parents can fly to every game first class. I can't give you cash, <clears throat> but go look in your driveway, Marty McFly. You've got a brand new car that Biff just polished. I can't give you cash. But boy, do I have some parties for you to go to on a yacht. I can't give you cash, but your uncle may have an envelope under the doormat of the passenger side of a brand new vehicle. Everybody's doing it. I'm going to do it. If I don't do it, how can I compete? The NCAA created this. The NCAA can stop this. Let's not talk about it anymore. Either level the playing field or recognize the differences that are going to be created and the lengths that certain schools will go from any big conference where there's money at stake. And we're not talking thousands of dollars. We are talking Tens of millions of dollars are at stake for these universities. Tens of millions. What's interesting to think about with college sports is that would you ever think that change will be made? And who is stopping the NCA from making changes? Well, teams and universities that have the greatest advantage by breaking the rules as often as they do to get the top recruited classes. We do a show on CBS ranking the level of recruits. The number one ranking school, they got the best players. Alabama's in the top four every year. It's funny to think about, isn't it? It's funny to think about that we're all complicit. All of us. I work for a company that makes money because universities act the way they do. What would be the fun of signing day if everyone has the same chance to go to every single school? I guess the decision, would that be must-see watching? I don't want to get rid of the lawyers. I want more lawyers. I want lawyers to be able to draft documents, explain those documents to coaches, explain it to GMs, explain it to athletic directors, explain it to employers, explain it to owners, 
so that everyone knows the rules of engagement. Isn't that what we've been talking about this entire show so far? The rules of engagement. What is acceptable? What is not acceptable? Are there things that you should know that aren't acceptable before you're told they're not acceptable? That's what a moral compass is. When we come back, we're gonna review an important movie. Stick around. This is David Sampson, Nothing Personal. Welcome back to Nothing Personal on a day that the show changed right as we were about to tape with the news of Jared Porter being fired as the GM of the Mets, the news of Jeremy Pruitt being fired. I wanted to spend a bit of time reviewing a movie called One Night in Miami. I want to do a shout out to Coca's grandfather and to a loyal listener in Nicaragua. I cannot believe how thankful I am for everybody who listens and watches Nothing Personal, for downloading it, for subscribing it, for telling your friends about it. We are around the world. A listener in Nicaragua listened to the show yesterday, along with Grandpa Coca, and said, May Day was your word of the day. May Day comes from the French M apostrophe A-I-D-E-R, which actually means help me in French. I didn't know that. And je parle français. Je connais le mot May Day, la verbe a day to help. May Day, help me. I've said May Day so many times in French, but when I'm speaking French in my head, it's May Day. S'il vous plaît, May Day. J'ai perdu. I have been lost. Je suis perdu. Help me. I never thought of May Day as in it, we're going down May Day, May Day. But that's what it means. Thank you for that. Okay. Very quickly. On the nothing personal pick of the day. Thank you for taking the Knicks yesterday because we're back. The Knicks win on Martin Luther King Day. Hope you liked the Martin Luther King Day story yesterday about the Knicks game. We're now six and 10. The Jazz are six and a half points over the Pelicans. Stan Van Gundy has his hands full with that team. The Utah Jazz at nine and four, I believe, is their record with Donovan Mitchell. Rudy Gobert, the highest paid big man. I like the Jazz six and a half over the Pelicans. The movie that I got to watch, which I do watch every single day, a movie, Oscar time is happening. Lots of articles coming about about which movies are going to be nominated. The Oscars have been delayed. It used to be that a movie had to be released in a theater prior to December 31st of the year prior even if that movie had been released for a minute in a city on a certain number of screens in LA, believe it or not. Now the rules have all changed. So I'm reading everywhere. A new movie by, I forgot the name of the character. God damn it, Coca. I was going to have the smoothest comment right now. The movie directed by Cuba Gooding's wife in Jerry Maguire, Regina King. I know that's her name in real life, Coca. By the way, you're talking too loudly, please. That was way too loud. Yes, I know it's Regina King, but his character's name in Jerry Maguire, the football player for the Cardinals. Anyway, his wife was played by Regina King in a great performance. She has is a great actress, has done many great performances. She made her directorial debut in a movie called One Night in Miami. One Night in Miami is about a fictional night that may have been spent in Miami. The night after Muhammad Ali beat Sonny Liston to become the champion, heavyweight champion of the world. Sam Cooke, the singer. Jim Brown, the football player. Muhammad Ali, the boxer. And Malcolm X. The movie has a small cast. It is generally four men in a hotel room talking. It is four men talking in 1960s America where racism is strong, where Malcolm X is beginning to see the end. He would be assassinated a short time later. Where Muhammad Ali was Cassius Clay and becoming Muhammad Ali, where Sam Cooke was dealing with the reality that he may not be as active in the 
movement, as it is called, as he wanted to be and is taking advantage. What is interesting to me is that the movie itself is fine. I wouldn't call it great. I wouldn't call it Oscar worthy. The performances by the four actors were outstanding, two of whom very well may be nominated out of the four for an Oscar. The reason why I want you to see One Night in Miami is because of where we are in our country. Everything that went on in 2020, all of the Black Lives Matter, all of the change that was supposed to happen that may happen, maybe this was the inflection point. One Night in Miami makes it very clear that what was going on in the 60s is exactly the type of conversations that are going on right now in households where with people of color, in households that are lily white. The level of racism, of the systemic injustice that we have faced, especially recently, the attention that is being brought now is no different than the attention that was being brought in the 60s, in the 40s, in the 20s, in the 1800s. Is now the time where it's all gonna change? Regina King decided to do her part and put together a movie made for Amazon, where I believe the point of the movie was not to give you a fictionalized account of what these four friends could have been talking about, but was to make a statement that whatever these four friends had been talking about, we could have easily set this movie in 2021 on January 19th. The question is whether that movie can be set on January 20th. Tomorrow, January 20th, marks the first day of the 46th president of the United States. Joe Biden will be inaugurated at noon. Will the country begin to heal? Will it continue to evolve? Will it be the same old, same old partisan politics? There are more questions than answers this day than there were four years ago when the 45th president was elected. Many people were aware of what the next four years may have looked like, though dreaded it, were scared of it. With Joe Biden starting tomorrow, there are just as many people wondering, will my voice be heard? Whether my voice is Republican or Democrat? whether I am black or white or brown. Tomorrow at noon, questions will start to be answered again. The best thing about our Democratic Republic is we get a do over every four years in the White House. It is going to be a fascinating day tomorrow. We're gonna have more on the show tomorrow on this inauguration, because I wanna give some historical perspective on what it means to have a transfer of power, what it means for the first 100 days of a presidency, how that sets up, what it means in terms of how presidents start running for reelection the day they are elected, what it will mean to have a 50-50 Senate. These are important times with important issues. We have spent time on this show. We started with the behavior of a newly hired GM that under all scenarios is wrong, but under today's standards is the end of a career. We went on to the firing of someone who, by the way, does and did what everyone does. And we end with the possibility and the dream that tomorrow will be different. That's it for today's Nothing Personal. I appreciate your loyalty. And remember, 
It's just business. It's nothing personal. <laughs>